Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Long set of readings today. It seems like the longer Lent gets, the longer the readings are also, but they've tried to pack a lot into them in part because there's a lot on the bones, if you will, literally and figuratively today, but also because the church has in large part gotten out of the habit of attending midweek services or even scheduling them in a lot of places. And so they decided, well, they're not going to be there every week, twice a week. We're going to give them more once a week or something like that. But there is a lot here because there's a lot that's happening. And yet, with all of the different readings that we have, there's one thing that is a common thread, and that is, of course, that Jesus is the one who brings life and light to this world, the one in whom there is no darkness and the one from whom all good things proceed. Paul says, the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus. The Lord of life called Lazarus from the tomb, and here, many hundreds of years before the Christ would come to earth in flesh already, his spirit is working through the prophet to bring life to the valley of dry bones. Now while the story that we have of Lazarus with Mary and Martha is a historical account, the account that we have from Ezekiel, it's history, yes, but it's the history of a vision that the Lord gave to him. The Lord brought him in the spirit to see this valley of dry bones and laid out to him what the issue was. These are the dead in trespass, the dead in sin, the dead in spirit, the demoralized, the hurting, the aching. Not all of them under the condemnation of the law because there are still believers there, but they are all under the oppression that comes from being sinners in a sin-filled world. The nation... Well, the nation had split after the death of Solomon. The nation then in the northern kingdom had already vanished. And now the southern kingdom, the kingdom that was largely Judah, by now called Judea in many places, is being carried off by Babylon. And the Lord is telling the prophet to talk directly to these bones, to prophesy to them and see what happens. And so he does. He tells them, tell the bones. And you say, well, why would you do something like that? I've talked to a lot of things in this life that have given me absolutely no response. It's usually because I'm actually talking to myself. And you're probably the same way. The third time you bend a thin nail and rather hard wood, you start talking to the hammer or to the wood or to the nail, more so maybe than yourself. But finally, even if it's a slender nail going into hard wood, you should be able to figure it out. You talk to your medicine, tell it to work better. You talk sometimes to the clock to make it either go faster or slower, or likewise the calendar. You talk to all sorts of things, but it's really just a scorekeeping, a messaging, a, why can't things be different, why can't things be better? You certainly don't expect the hammer to answer you back, you don't expect the nail or the wood to give you any response at all, but here, talking to these dry bones, there is a response, pretty much immediate, because when the Lord wants something to happen, it happens. He says, tell these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And then he tells them how he's going to put them together piece by piece. The ligaments and the tendons and connective tissue and then the muscles are on there covered over with skin and then they're going to be alive. So he says, I did what I was told and it all started happening. And you can imagine, even if it's a vision, the sound of thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of bones rattling back together. That must have been a racket. Because even if it's coming in a vision, the Lord wants the prophet to know the enormity of the vision. He doesn't want some little tip tap off in the distance. This is a great rattling commotion. And he looks and he sees it. Not only are the bones coming together, by the time he looks down, 
The Lord is already putting things together and covering them over. No problem. There's a bunch of mannequins lying there on the floor of the valley. A bunch of dead people still. Because it doesn't matter if you're nothing left but a bag of bones or the flesh is on you and the muscles, the sinews, all of that there. If you aren't breathing, you're not alive, are you? So he's issued a command to the bones and now he issues a command, if you will, to the breath. Or the wind. Or even the spirit. Same word, sometimes you need context, and sometimes you just say, well, he's talking about all three of those at once, and in some ways here. The Lord tells him, tell the breath, come from the four winds and breathe on these slain that they may live. You've already met somebody lying lifeless in the earth much earlier in the scriptures, haven't you? Except it was just one then. And he wasn't dead in his trespasses, he just wasn't alive yet because the Lord wasn't finishing making him. Adam was not complete until the Lord breathed into him and he became a living soul. And what the Lord is telling his prophet and what the Lord is telling his people that just as he breathes into the one to give him life, so also his spirit breathes into the many to give them the life that they need. The physical life that many of the Israelites still have, yes, of course, but also the spiritual life that all of them need, that you and I need. Because it doesn't matter if you're lying on the floor of a valley in the Middle East or if you're lying in a grave somewhere around here, dead is dead. And you wouldn't be dead if you weren't a sinner. Something that all of us born on this earth have to look forward to, right? Even as we... Mark another one off as we see their obituary in the paper or hear it on KMMO or some such thing. That's one thing about death. As long as there's something living on this earth, there's something that's eventually going to be taken from this earth. And we are no exception. Those creatures, those living things that don't consciously sin are still hurt, corrupted, broken by sin. The whole creation groans, we hear. It has been under the oppression of Satan and darkness. And that includes us. And we would have no more volition of our own to save ourselves than does that valley of bones. They can't even give themselves a decent burial. It's not only are they dead and dry, but also they're alone and seemingly forgotten. And you don't have to be dead, dead, room temperature, flesh missing, down to nothing but bones, to know that dead is dead and that you're not going to get yourself out of it once again. And to feel like a sack of dead, dry bones while you're still alive, well, that's even worse, isn't it? To know that there are things happening to you that you have absolutely zero control over. Yeah, you can listen to your doctor, you can take your medicine, you can do the exercises that you're prescribed, you can try to live better, think better, and do better, but your plans, your hopes, and your dreams are going to eventually fall apart. <coughs> because we are broken top to bottom, inside and out. In fact, we know that Spiritually, we're born dead. Even as we grow in our mother's wombs, we already have as much or more to identify ourselves with the valley of dry bones than we do with any of the people we hear about in today's scriptures or elsewhere. At least Mary and Martha and Jesus and the disciples with them are all still alive and kicking. But we, dead in our sins, dead in our trespasses, can't fix that. But God doesn't want to abandon us to death, does he? He sent his son to suffer death so that we would be alive once again. And he asks Ezekiel that one question. Son of man, can these bones live? And what's a good answer when God asks you a question? 
Lord, you know. In fact, you're the only one who knows the really important stuff. Ezekiel probably figures, whatever the lesson is that I'm going to learn here, I'm going to pay attention because it's God talking. And this is recorded so that you listen to it and you pay attention to it because it's still God talking. Can these bones live? For us, it would be a dumb question. Doesn't matter if it's a beloved pet or somebody who you grew up with or somebody you knew in school or somebody who you just have liked in later life. You cannot affect their life once it is gone. There is nothing you can do about it. Any more than finally you can do it about your own. And spiritually, emotionally, mentally, also. Sometimes you feel like that bag of bones that you just can't incite to any great enthusiasm, vigor, mental or physical energy. You just want to be that lump that sits there and takes it until there's nothing left to take. So when the Lord asks the prophet, Son of man, can these bones live? He also asks you if you believe that you can truly live. That you can have not only life beyond the grave, but real life before the grave. Life that really means something. Life that even if it seems like a rut, that you know you've got problems and issues, worries, it finally all belongs to the Lord. And that it is all transient. It will all fall away. It will be gone. And yes, unless the world ends, you're going to have to die in order to leave behind some of that stuff that you don't want right now, but... You will leave it behind, but you will not leave behind your life entrusted to God. Even in death, you know that Christ is the life of all the living. God is not a God of the dead, but of the living. And he calls you to an abundant and full and complete life now in anticipation of a holy, righteous, sin-free, pain-free life in the everlasting. Yes, these bones can live. And although Ezekiel hadn't seen everything the Lord was laying out for him, he probably could have answered, but like us, he hedges his bets. You know, Lord. But can I see? Can the Lord make you more agreeable to others? Better to live with in your own skin? Can he take away any of the problems, issues, pains that you have, physical, mental, spiritual? He can. Whether or not he does is his decision for what is best for you. But what he can do is take away the final pain of everlasting death, of total abandonment, forsakenment. You are not going to end up lying your bleached bones in a valley forever and ever and ever. And you're certainly not going to be raised up just to face a death even worse than the one we face on earth now. A death that's total and eternal. Without God, without Christ, without hope. You are not going to be damned and forsaken (coughs) if you believe that the Lord who grants the vision of the bones here and grants the reality as Jesus calls Lazarus out of the tomb who shows himself that even in death he is the Lord of life. Because remember, when Jesus dies, the tombs of the saints are opened. And many of them go out after Jesus is raised from the dead to testify to the people of Jerusalem. Jesus' death is strong enough to bring life to those saints in the tomb and to the saints who are here today. If you want to know if you're going to live, God's got a pretty good track record of bringing, sustaining, and completing life. And unlike everyone who has lived before you, save Elijah and Enoch, as far as we know, all have passed through death, yet all who believe in God, trust in the promises of the Savior, are still alive in him. You and I are alive in him. We share the same heavenly altar as all of our family and all of our friends who died in the faith and already gathered to Christ to await their own resurrection. 
We're part of that company with the angels, the archangels, all the company of heaven, all the saints laid to rest, and all of those still living on this earth. All of us poor sacks of bone, us poor, aching, pained little pieces of animated meat. Because when you look at the world's way of looking at us, that's all we really are. Some random accident that somehow sparks motion and thought until it's gone once again. But you aren't an accident. You aren't an afterthought. You are God's beloved child. And he wants your bones, your sinews, your flesh, your skin, every part of you to live. And to live in his love. And to live in his light. And to live forever. You've already died death with Christ in, his, in your baptism. And when you die again, it's not going to be such a big deal because it's the transition to the better life that's yet to come. Your bones, your flesh, your brains, your heart, whatever you have, all of it is being renewed and restored day by day as you ask the Lord to forgive your sins and give you life here, but even more so, there's the promise that just as Christ is glorified in his resurrection, you also are glorified in yours. And you won't fear darkness, pain, or death anymore. But you really don't have to fear him now because Christ, the life of all the living, is the light of all the living. He is your light. And he shows you clearly just how much he loves you by offering himself into death. And how God accepted that sacrifice by raising him, by raising Lazarus, by raising the saints from their tombs and granting them life on this earth once again in anticipation of the life all of us will share in the resurrection. May God grant you ease of your earthly pains, whether the body, the mind, or the spirit, but especially may he grant you the knowledge that whatever happens in this life, your bones will be raised up and they will be clad in a body better than you've ever known. And they will live within you in the presence of God forever and ever. In the name of Jesus, amen. The peace that surpasses understanding keep you in Christ Jesus. Amen.